I think if we look, listen carefully to, as, as I teach this today in these tapes, as far as I'm concerned, you'll probably hear the uh, things from the Word of God that are absolutely essential to uh, making the division of these men realistic. This is Mike. Heavenly Father, thank you for your wisdom, your understanding that you're giving to us, your knowledge. You don't want anybody ignorant down here. I know you don't. And this beautiful planet you've left us and given to us. I think you want us to, to prosper. I always have thought you wanted us to prosper in all of our ways. And uh, we've just been kind of rebellious about it. The flesh wants to do its own thing, and of course it belongs to the devil. People don't see that either too well till you give them light. So thank you for bringing us together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Get your Bible. We're teaching on apostolic church planning. As close as I can, I'm not a scholar about it, but I have read my Bible a long time and experienced the things of God and have walked this out for 40 years. And not in a uh, stay camped out over here. Or, the cross looks good. Let's camp here. Uh, I, I pray in tongues now. We can stop here. No, all those things are good. But we assume, as we're studying the Word, and I assume as I'm teaching the Word, I have nothing... I have nothing to gain by any of this. If anything, if anything, I was chastised for years for following the word. All right. You can hear a little fan in the background. I'm charging some batteries for my home system. Anyway, the, uh, the church has never come together too much concerning the things we've been talking about. And I wanted to talk about what the Bible says about planting churches. So I've seen every kind of scheme there is, but but uh, now we're going to go by what it says. Uh, I'm not a novice in these things. I will tell you that. The Lord called me a long time ago, 40 years ago, to teach his people. And I told him at that time, when I heard him speak to me, I was so surprised. Wondrous. It was wondrous for me. It was too wonderful. I was 28, 29 years old. And, uh, I thought it was just wonderful that uh, God was speaking to me inside, just speaking English. I thought it was great. Like a man speaks to a man. Teach my people. At the end of that conversation, I said, you've got the short end of the stick. I'm not a very good teacher, and I don't like your people. It's as simple as that. I don't like Christians, born-again, spirit-filled Christians. I just I, they're narrow-minded, didn't think well, didn't carry themselves well in the thought patterns that they did have, and they hit certain areas that just kind of glazed over and became bigots. So it seems like everybody was running their own little kingdom. So I went to the Word and stayed in it for years. I read and read and read and read and listened, 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 read and read and read until I got it in me. Lots of Word, lots of Word, just lots of Word. Let the Word govern me. And that's what I did. These teachings are on apostolic church planting, where it comes from. Now, if you listen to these men in the Bible making a legitimate it's a legitimate appeal. If you read them and read them and read them, but you have to you have to acknowledge an occurrence of a little word. If my people, it occurs all the time. If my people, if my people. Well, the problem is, if my people, the people are so fractured, they're so competitive. I've learned this. They're just petty, and sectarian. They have their minds made up. It's hard to mobilize them. You couldn't get it done. I think there's enough dunamis power in the in the Baton Rouge area to blow up Louisiana. It's powerful, properly aligned, and someone answers the bell. But the sectarianism is, is such a division. It's reduced the house of God. It's not, it's not speaking as one voice. What people hear is a cacophony of a litany of of uh, what it's supposed to be, but it's not a clear sound. Paul said, if you don't, if the bugle doesn't make a clear sound, Paul said, who's going to answer it? Who's going to come? They don't even know what's being played. Now, I've felt for some reason in the last while that I need to make this serious. And I realize I teach some radical principles, but 
I, as I said before, I don't have a personal agenda in this whatsoever. I, I don't. But for a while, I just quit. You can't help people. And I don't assume to be another Paul or anybody like that by any means, but the last words of, of Acts chapter 28 tell us this. Paul dwelt two whole years in his own heart house, his own house, is what it says. He received all that came into him, preaching the kingdom of God and and uh, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with utmost freedom, he uh, he didn't have hindrance to anybody. He didn't have to answer to anybody. Now, I have lived in my own hired house for these many years and did not take a uh, a penny from anybody that the Lord didn't touch to do. But I didn't. I wasn't told by anybody what to do and what not to do. I had no personal agenda. I did what the Holy Spirit said to do, and it's very costly. It's real costly. No denomination told me what to do. I didn't belong to any. Now, I resisted that kind of sectarianism all my Christian life. Now, having said that, uh, I'm a Bible thumper by myself. I have no personal agenda with anybody in anything, any denomination, or any peoples. Nobody pays our bills. The Lord does. I'm deeply, profoundly, and personally, and unalterably, I'm concerned to know what God says we should be doing right now. And I've said it over and over again. And uh, it doesn't pass through a filter of some denomination or sectarian body to tell me or you what to do. It's only when you free yourself from uh, some vested interest that you're able to hear the Word of God clearly. And uh, if you hear the Word of God through a certain grid, that grid is going to color that Word. It just will. You have to be free from it. Now, I want you to open your Bible to Acts 19. Acts 19. I don't know how much you listened to that word on the last tape, but I need to reiterate the the uh, word. There's no test. There's no place in the New Testament for designating a gathering of God's people in any other way than by geography. We we talked about this. Not denomination. There's no place in the New Testament that says that uh, Pentecostals should all be lumped together in one place. You're Pentecostal. Now, when I was first converted, my wife and I, Jerry, she's deceased now, we spoke in tongues. We received divine healing. We received what we found in the Bible, and the Spirit of God was upon us powerfully that we didn't go to church for six months. I, I kept asking the Lord, we need to go to a church, we need to get in the body. It had a, a strong driving to be belong, that we belonged to something now. Now we belonged. We went to a Baptist church, and they were teaching, it was strong, heavy right then. The Left Behind series was pretty strong, similar to that. Uh, you know, you're going to get your head cut off, and all this stuff's going to happen to you. You're going to get raptured uh, uh, pre tribulation of course it'll get you out of here the holy spirit will lift you out and i thought that was and after i've read the martyr martyr books fox's martyr books of martyrs and, and people that have paid the price to be a christian not the ones that walked around screaming you got to be born again but those that, that went into the mission field where those people were cutting your heads off and killing you and they'd, hundreds would be killed at times and this fella was ministering up there and he and uh, he played in a movie. Several of us went. We just wanted to go see. And uh, he had a uh, altar call. They don't have altars in churches, but he had an altar call and said, "If you want to miss the miss the tribulation, miss all the hell that's going to happen, all what God's going to do, what the devil's going to do, you won't know which one's doing what. But what you're going to do? Come up here and say this prayer with us." And he did. I talked to him. I was an engineer at the uranium plant at that time, uranium reduction plant. That's no mean. I was not a street thug or anything. A kid, somebody trying to leech off the body of Christ or whatever. But I was a, a giving responsible part of society and the church. 
So I asked him some questions and, and talked about speaking in tongues, divine healing. These, are these things, what do you think about these things? He said, well, the tongues thing is you're a Pentecostal or a charismatic, but mostly Pentecostal. He said, divine health and healing is, is done away with. That does not, that doesn't happen. If, if it does, the devil's doing it. And I said, so the Bible it doesn't mean what it says. Well, it does, but it doesn't. And, uh, and uh, he discouraged us from doing anything that the Bible says to do as far as as uh, supernatural in the Holy Spirit. You can you can do this without God, pretty, pretty much looks like it to me. It was very discouraging right from the very beginning, but we weren't discouraged. And I said, well, we got to go find a Pentecostal church. Apparently we're Pentecostals. So we did. I found a little Assembly of God church, and they believed in everything, but they screamed it. And uh, they had little Bible studies that were kind of you know, mediocre at the best. But boy, they had a heart for God. I love that pastor. He was a cowboy pastor, him and his wife. And uh, they were just sweet people. They loved the Lord. They deeply loved the Lord. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned a bunch. My wife and I smoked cigarettes at the time. And uh, he said, well, we want you to join the church, but you can't smoke cigarettes. You can't do this, you can't do that. There was a lot of rules, and I understand, I understand them. I don't believe that you can, that uh, smoking cigarettes will keep you out of heaven, or keep you out of hell. I do believe they'll get you there quicker, whatever place you're going to, because it's kind of a slow suicide. You're taking a chance smoking any way that you could <laughs> lung cancer and die, or emphysema, or something else will kill you. It'll just kill you quicker. But I don't believe, I don't believe it's mortal sin. I just don't think it's good for you. And I do now more than anything. I think it's 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 a, it's kind of, it's a sin. You shouldn't have it. You shouldn't do it. It'll kill you. You won't fulfill what you're supposed to do. Plant an apostolic church. We never did join the church because we didn't quit smoking. And my wife got horribly angry with them and said, "Okay, we can join your church, but we're born again spirit filled. The Holy Spirit will take us, and He'll take us in the kingdom. And he'll give us the privileges of the children of God." And she said, we've had them. We've enjoyed the great things of God. We've enjoyed the outpouring of His Holy Spirit. We've enjoyed divine health and divine healing. We've enjoyed speaking in tongues, and we pray in tongues. We were both, uh, I can't say we're intellectuals, but we weren't on the low part of the totem pole there. We were avid readers and, and enjoying the educational privileges that were given to us as Americans. We could... I mean, my wife spent most of her young life in the library. She went to college for 15 years. She <laughs> had a couple degrees. She loved reading. So did I. Engineering, art. Just I just enjoyed it. Many different books. Many different things we enjoyed from that part of the world. We Well, we figured Christians should be the two. But what the, the idea was that we were allowed in the kingdom. Uh, the Holy Spirit didn't reject us for anything. He, and he started working on us little by little as he does bring you into sanctification. There are things you don't do anymore. Uh, but this pastor's just, we weren't going to quit smoking. She told him, we're not going to quit smoking to join your church. And she was kind of a, yeah, she was liberated to say that. She had to, we had to learn a whole lot of things coming into the body of Christ. But but the Holy Spirit was gentle and easy with us. And we came. It says he lead. We, we said, okay. And we, we did what we were supposed to do. They cried. The pastor was crying. All you have to do is just say you quit smoking. Don't, don't smoke for a day. And you quit smoking. You can sign the paper to join the church. Because we just well, we love you. We want you in. We love you. And it was almost like you can't be part of our, 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 our team. You'll always be a second-class citizen. You're never going to make it. Now, the first church did that to us. Now this church is doing it to us, and we loved them. We stuck with it. But yet they wouldn't let us be part of the body of Christ, and we couldn't be part of that uh, party, so to speak, because of what they said. Now, the writers in the New Testament, they... It wasn't a qualification to, to, to be a Pentecostal, to speak in tongues, but I think all the men in the New Testament spoke in tongues. This is what we tried to tell them all. It's not cigarettes. There wasn't a group that, that specialized in, in anything, like tongues and so forth. All of our sectarian names are their emphasis upon one aspect of truth. 
They just are. Now, even the Pentecostals. There was uh, Pentecostals who are known for being tongues talkers. That sort of stuff that goes along with it. They camp right there. They separate them. Baptists are Baptists. What you know? They immerse. They baptize. Presbyterians. Baptist comes from the Greek word baptizo. Presbyterians comes from presbyteron. And that means it means a form of government, a leadership in government. Episcopals. That's another Bible word. It comes from the Greek word which comes from episkopat. It's a a form of uh, a church government again, Episcopal. A Lutheran, obviously, comes from Martin Luther, his Protestant influence, and, and on and on. All of these designations are designations of a part of a whole, which is in themselves very divisive, extremely divisive. Now, what I'm presenting is very ultimate. But what's all wrong with ultimacy? What is it? Our problem is that I know what should be, but this is what is. And then we automatically think what is is to be the ultimate. This is mostly what it is. And as you as you learn it as listen, I know some Presbyterian ministers and they said this don't ever preach the level of your experience. I had many ministers say that to me. Preach the ideal. The Holy Spirit told me that too. You'll save yourself and as well as those that hear you, told Timothy. Don't teach what you have. If you and I establish where we are now is the ideal, well, that's as far as we're going to go. We won't preach anything past that. Now, I want to talk to you about the ideal. And the ideal is this. When God's kingdom comes, when the government of God really is established here, and it will happen, and the kinds of things that we're envisioning now uh, are brought to bound, you're going to have every geographical area, God's people will be there without sick sectarian marks, it's not no sectarian marks, uh, and that's very idealistic, I know it is, but that's the way I've run it all my life, not, I wasn't anything, You're, you won't be a good Baptist, you won't be a great Pentecostal, you won't be a Luther, you make a virtue out of a vice, he, he's a good Baptist, he's a good Pentecostal, he's a good sectarian, yeah, okay, he's a good sectarian, I'm a Christian, and the Bible's my book, and all the Christians in the geographical area where I live, and I belong to them, and they belong to me. Uh, they're not their own. Period. And that's the way it is. Now, if we don't talk about the ideal, we'll never obtain it, ever. You won't If you don't preach it, you'll never get there. So, let's start out now by by uh, talking from the passage is, is haunting. And, uh, Let's see here. Uh huh. Let's say let's look at these in the in the, the word. Hold on, let me find it. We have to go through these situations for our sanctification anyway. Jesus said this. He had twelve to be with him, didn't he? Everywhere Jesus went, he went in plurality. He did. Now, the interesting thing is this. That the Father gave Jesus a devil, didn't he? Now, I'm getting somewhere with this, so listen. Stay with me. That's interesting, isn't it? Did you ever wonder? Just in his his, his prayer said those to have you, you the, give, everyone you've given me, uh, the, the disciples were the gift of the Father, but one of them was a devil, and Jesus prayed for them. In fact, the one who was the devil was also was the treasurer. <laughs> hey, money, think about that. The Bible said that he dipped in the bag occasionally. Yeah. Now, he was also hell's representative to scrutinize the character and the conduct of Jesus. Now, you think of that for yourself. His beat little eyes watched Jesus all the time. How did he talk to the women? How did he treat the men? How did he behave with money? How did, he, how did he handle popularity? How did he deal with this and deal with that situation, this situation? How did he deal with it? He was scrutinizing. Now, eventually, when he betrayed Jesus, he uh, realized what he'd done. He took the money back and 
He threw it at their feet. He said, he said uh, to the priest, he said, he said and cried out, I have betrayed innocent blood. He's holy. He's innocent. He's, he's picky. The father gave Jesus a devil so that hell could be representative and scrutinize every act and every aspect of the Lord Jesus. And the verdict of hell was this. He's innocent. Have you ever seen that before? That's so interesting to me. Acts 13.13, 13, and when Paul and his company, Paul and his company, let's say that, Paul and his company, Paul and his company, loose from Pethros, they came to Pergos and Pamphylia, and John departed them, and he returned to Jerusalem. Acts 19.29. Acts 19.29. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel. They were Paul's companions in travel. Say that. Paul's companions in travel. They rushed in one accord into the theater. Acts 21.8. Acts 21.8. And the next day we would... Where of Paul's company, Paul's company, Paul's company. This is going somewhere. They departed and came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and we abode with him. Now, scholars tell us this: there are probably as many as 45 to 46 men that are traceable in the New Testament who belong to Paul's company. His apostolic company. Now, those are two different things. Apostolic company. Just a, a Timothy, Erastus, Aristarchus, Titus, Tychicus, Priscilla, Aquila, a later Apollos, and, uh, and many more. There was a lot more, 45. These were in Paul's company, apostolic company. And this is a fulfillment of the Bible passage which says this. Two are better than one. For one falls down, the other one will pick him up, of course. And and if one gets cold, the other one will keep him warm. And they have a, a better reward for their labor as well. Two are better than one. So, you know, as a contractor, I saw this was from the very beginning. You have one man doing the work. That's what you get, one man. But you have two. Two men can almost do the work of three. And at times, as good as three. So you, you'll do it all right on that. Now, in the beginning also, God made everything two by two. And and, it, and he said it was good. With Adam, uh, after he had, after the seventh day of which he had celebrated his communion, on the seventh day, he looked down one day and he said, well, that's not good for him to be alone like that. That's not good. So... He saw Adam alone, and he said, it's not good for a man to be alone. It's just not good. Adam wondered about it, too. I know that. He did. Every night when everything bedded down, they did it in pairs except Adam. Adam went home alone, sleeping in the garden alone. And so God gave Adam Eve. He saw two are better than one. Plurality is absolutely essential, isn't it? And we, we need to understand plurality when we'll get to it. I, I, we'll, we'll see. Now, I want to talk to you about two kinds of evangelism. Great in church. Two kinds. That it comes out of our, our text today. This is something that we need to mule over. Talk about. Digest it. Now, I don't beg you to, to agree with me, but I'm asking you to consider what I'm about to say. I don't have any agenda here. I think personally that what I'm about to say is going to be... Well, it lies an answer for many of our problems we have right now. Ephesians, we said yesterday, was a very important book. It's a great epistle, and it's a very important letter to the Ephesians. Turn turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We get in there. If you don't have a Bible, you should go get one. 
Go get your Bible. Ephesians chapter 4. Yeah, it's real important. Ephesians is a wonderful revelation. You should read it over and over and over again. It's just be a lump sum. It. Just read it. Like weightlifting. Look at verse 11. Chapter 4. Ephesians 4, 11. And uh, let's go back up to 10. He that descended is he himself also that ascended far above all heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave. Now, when Jesus ascended, he ascended um, with the avowed purpose of of restoring what Adam had lost and to uh, fill all things, fill the earth with his glory. Yeah. It's a Greek word, paloma, fullness. Now, how's he going to do this? How's he going to do this? And he gave some to be apostles, and some to be uh, prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, perfection of the saints, and the work of service, ministry, catechiso, it means the adjusting of the saints, for the work of ministry, and the work of service, diakonos, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we come and attain the unity of the faith. Now, let's talk about this for a minute, what he's going to do, how he's going to do it. Remember, I spoke to you last night about the Roman Catholic's uh, dilemma about spiritual authority. Now, the Father made Christ head over the church, not the Pope. Uh, the church has his head as the Lord Jesus, the church of Christ. Now, when he ascended on high, he organized uh, his earthly situation, earthly ministry, and he gave some to be apostles. Now the Greek word there is is kind of clumsy. It's not it's not literal like this. And if you were to translate it, it, it would be it, it would make clumsy reading. That tight, it needs to be tightened up. But here's how the Greek says: When he ascended, he himself, he and no one else, nobody else, gave some to be apostles some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be teachers, <clears throat> pastor teachers. He himself did this. He and no other did this. Now, that, immediately, it rules out the uh, every kind of human ecclesiastical con uh, type of appointment of, of ministers right there. They can be involved in it, but they've got to be under that headship. With one sweep, he uh, he did away with everything that does not have the divine imprivata on it of Jesus, immediate being immediate choice of Jesus. You can call yourself an apostle. You can go to school to be an apostle, but that doesn't make an apostle, that's for sure. You're an apostle because Jesus gifted you to be an apostle or a prophet, or a teacher, or an evangelist, or a shepherd teacher. And uh, I'm going to repeat that. All these good things about the coalition are great. They're marvelous. They are. But they're a drop in the bucket to what is yet to come, I believe. But it's going to come when God judges human ecclesiastical authoritarianism and we see a restoration of Jesus Christ's unilateral independent establishment of spiritual government and authority in the earth through his chosen apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherd teachers. I believe that and that's what the Bible says and I, I totally believe that. I've seen it. Like Bishop Lightfoot and others would have would uh, help you out of that dilemma. Now, probably one of the the uh, gifts that need to be defined more in our day would be would be the gift of evangelists. 
in evangelism. You know, it's a wonderful anointing to be under, but they all need to be defined. There are some good teachers here now. But Paul's company was an apostolic company, church planters, whose job it was to, to uh, plant churches. That's what they did. They just didn't go out and win souls. They didn't do that. They planted churches, and they didn't just win souls. They planted churches. Paul said, I am a master architect, a master builder. I lay the foundation that every man take heed how he builds on it. You better watch that. God's not interested in freelance Christians. He's not. And God's interested in planting communities and believers in every place. That's what he's doing. Now, that's another geographical term as well. To the saints which are at Corinth, with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord. Place. Not denomination. Geography is the total definition of the people of God. It's geography is labeled from geography. How many understand this? This is what I'm trying to say. The landscape is dotted with monuments to our division. Yeah, it's everywhere. It used to discourage me so bad. We ought to be able to go to, to East Baton Rouge and know Jesus' address. Go to New Orleans and know his address. For Jesus' address will be where the Lord's people are. Where are the anointed ones that we find in unity in Baton Rouge, in East Baton Rouge, South Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Thibodeau? They shouldn't have these sectarian marks everywhere. Now, if you read the Saturday Night Church page, wherever you are, it's full of insults. We're the friendly church. We're the good church. We're the church that loves you. We all love everybody. We all love their, their, uh, <laughs> it's just not right, are you? Are you the friendly church? Now, let's talk about that for a minute. The apostolic company consists of uh, apostles. Number one, if you write that down. Prophets, number two. And evangelists. Let's take those three, for instance. He has sent to the church... Paul says this, first, apostles, second, there are the prophets. Uh, put this in your head now. Let's we'll just drop this in there now. I believe in prophecy. Uh, I believe it so strongly that I grieve over its misuse, and I've prophesied most of my life. This whole age is to be marked by prophecy. Your old man, your young men shall prophesy. It should be that. The whole age should be that, marked by it. And that's good. But it's misused. This is a prophetic age, but it's misused. We got all kinds of prophets running around, and there's some good ones, but there's a lot of them that feel it needs to be a prophetic movement. We don't need a prophetic movement. We don't need an evangelistic movement. We don't need a an apostolic movement. We don't need a pastor teacher movement. We need a God movement. God needs to move. We want Him to move. The prophets will never function normally without the oversight of apostles. It won't happen. And some of them are still alive. There's a lot of apostles here. Wherever you have prophets combining to become something in themselves, they're violating God's very clear-cut order of, as uh, he said in the church, first apostles, second, secondarily prophets. So, you got to think about that. Firstly, secondary is to waste words. He didn't say that just to waste words. This is the order that it happens in. Apostles, prophets. Now, the apostle, prophet, evangelist are all mobile men. These people are supposed to be mobile, as we see this. I'm using the word mobile. Mobile. What's the meaning of the word apostle? First of all, it's the Greek word apostolos, which means one sent. A sent one. Paul stayed longer in Ephesus than any place he stayed there about two and a half years, three years. He stayed there longer than anywhere. Paul would say, I have no place in these parts anymore, and he would go on. Why do you do that? Because an apostle is a goer. He's got to go. He's a mobile man. He's a church planter. That's what he does. And what about the prophets? Are you thinking poop? the prophets are goer too, if you read in the New Testament about the prophets, Agabus and Silas. They were goers, and if you fact the divotee about it, that a prophet was only allowed to stay in the church 
two to three days, and he created enough problems for three days to last forever. <laughs> you stir them up. Yeah, problems can do that. That's what they're supposed to do. So the apostle, who's the one who goes, he's mobile. And the prophet is the one who goes, he's mobile too. Because, why is he? Because he should be with the apostle, that's why. If you look at it, just look at it like it is. What about the evangelist? Oh, that's wonderful. The evangelist of Gore, too. He used to go into all the world and preach the, preach the euangelio, the word. He's an evangelist. He's an evangel. The Bible doesn't say that the evangelist is to go into all the churches and hold campaigns. It doesn't say that at all. Yeah, evangelist so and so are going to be here for a week. The evangelist belongs in the world. The apostle, prophet, and evangelist are church planters. Now, that's my views. What happens when they go into a, a virgin area? What makes it so difficult to talk about is, is that uh, when Paul started out, all the area was virgin. I mean, that's that's it. Now we have to... Remodeling is a lot harder than building. Let's put it this way. It's it's far easier to build a new house than to remodel an old one. I've done these both, so it does. Now, we've got a horrible remodeling job to do if, if we do remodeling. If you look at it like that. Have you ever noticed this about an evangelist, though? They, An evangelist does... Uh, he's a soul winner. That's what evangelists do. I've been under that anointing. He just, he just wins souls. And, and beyond winning souls, he doesn't care much. He's a soul winner. Sometimes you, you get upset with an evangelist because he's got this gift, and he, he'll say blue cheese and everybody repents. I mean, said, look at that car out there, and everybody comes to Christ. But it's a tremendous gift. It is it's powerful. Now, remember, we're talking about buildings, about the metaphor for the church, the building. Buildings. I will build my church. And that's what he said, right? I'll build my church. That's a metaphor. What did Paul call himself? A master builder, a master architect. That's what he was. That's what he called himself. Now, we're talking about buildings. Let's stay with the building metaphor for a while. Just for a minute or two. What's the evangelist in the building metaphor? What does he do? The evangelist is the man that blasts the rocks out of the quarry. He blasts the stones out of that quarry. Boom! You're supposed to be blessed in the kingdom of God. He comes into a virgin territory with Paul and Silas, let's say. And he'll get out there and preach the word, blast the stones loose, and they come in. You got a big pile of stones over there. My God, what do I do with the stones? He's got a pile of them now, what do he do? And if he's stupid enough, he'll stay there and try to pastor them. That's what he's going to do. They, the only way that he can pastor them is he keeps preaching to you the, you know, the gospel over and over and over again, Eon Delion, over and over. Every Sunday, if we get a new word, we get saved again. The evangelist understands his ministry. If he understands that he'll travel with an apostle and prophet, and he'll blast the stones out of the quarry, and, and he'll say to the apostle, you build the house, there's the stones. The apostles can be terribly boring. Well, boring's a good word, but yeah, technical boring. Why? When you read about Paul going into the synagogue, it says that he argued and debated with them hour after hour the word. They have to defend it. Uh, apostles are long-winded. That's what they do. And apostles are not exciting like evangelists are. Why? Because they have the hard job of building the house and putting it together. There's a lot to it. Now, Paul, apparently, when he got to Troas, and remember this, he, he apparently didn't have a prophet with him. And uh, he started to speak and doing his thing and went on and on and on, long-winded. Ha! <laughs> long time. A young fellow sitting up on the third floor fell off. He fell out of the window. He got sleepy. He just fell down. Killed him, in my opinion. Paul went over there and revived him, brought him back to life again, and went and ate something and started, propped him up and started preaching again. But I think if the prophet would have been with him, he would have been asleep. Every once in a while, he would pause, and that prophet would scream out, thus saith the Lord, and start prophesying and get him all woke up again. And then Paul would go back and expound on everything. And Paul would go on with what he was supposed to do as an apostle. 
Now, Paul was not detoured by the fact that he fell out of the window either. He propped him back up after he got brought back to life, and the Bible said he had something to eat and preached till morning. <laughs> that was interesting just to read that. That's power. An apostle is a master teacher. The apostle is uh, is the answer to God's construction intentions in the earth. He's a general contractor, master builder, architect. When the apostle is a prophet and evangelist to go into virgin territory, these three, let's say they go into Thessalonica. And uh, they plant a church in Thessalonica. And, or, or Berea, or Lystra, or Derby, or any place they went, really, really. You can look at it like that. Now listen to this. You'll search the scriptures in vain, you will, to find an apostolic company ever going back to the place where they planted a church to replant it again, to do the same work again. You won't find that. If they went back, they went back to encourage them to enlighten and encourage the Christians, but never to redo it. Because once they planted a church, once they built it, which is the first phase of, 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 of church building and church planning evangelism, the second phase of evangelism sets in. And this is never called back in the same geographical area again. Not to do the same thing again. They won't do that. What's the second aspect of it? Of evangelism and church building. The body make an increase of itself. The body makes increase of itself. When the apostolic company leaves the town. They leave the town in charge of elders. They're in charge of it. Now this word needs some help too to find it out. It's equivalent to um, pastors. Pretty close. Now let me say something to you about pastors too. The word pastor comes from the Greek word poine. And 17 times in the New Testament poine is pointed and translated shepherd 17 times poine that is the meaning of the Greek word uh, poine now how in the world do they translate it 17 times shepherd and once pastor one time pastor only once pastor that was a getter to me too I don't think you can play games with shepherd right I mean, you can make anything you want to out of pastor it can be anything how much easier it would have been if, if the translator would have said the shepherd teacher. But they put this other word in, pastor. I, I think it was skullduggery. And the same kind of skullduggery here is, there, is in the word baptism. Yeah, well, okay. Because when King James authorized the Bible, he said you don't play games with church customs period and by this time they were they were baptizing the instruments and sprinkling you know now they knew very well that if they translated that the Greek word baptizo as Dr. Rotherham translates it in his translation he, he translates it this way immersed that's the original translation is immersed and so instead of using a translation that was real right one they transliterated it. They transliterated it. They took the Greek word and maintained the Greek word that you and I, every time we say baptized, we're talking Greek. That's baptized is Greek. And you need to ask yourself, what does that word mean? And when we go to a lexicon to find out what it really means, it means to immerse. It doesn't mean to sprinkle. Uh-uh, immerse. There's a, mean, there's a reason for all of it, a meaning. King James says also this, don't play with the word bishop. Don't do that. Because no bishop, no king. <laughs> that was a hierarchy order of the day at that time. And it was. The word bishop, it means overseer. 
so that Presbyteros, Episcopos, and Poime are all the same from the same office. They are the same office, really. They're the same office. Now, when the apostolic company has planted a church, they got her going, it leaves the church under the leadership and oversight anointed of pastor teachers. Pastor teachers. Now, the only difference between an elder and a, and a deacon is uh, that an elder must be apt to teach. Now, a real shepherd is characterized by the fact that he feeds the flock of God. The deacon takes care of the flock in practical manners and ways, but characterized, he's got to be of the same character as the elder. The only difference between the elder and the deacon is that an elder must be up to teach. That's what it says. That's it. The pastor and the shepherd cannot teach. He's disqualified as a shepherd if he can't teach. And probably there are many shepherds who are deacons. And probably many deacons who are shepherds too. Got a stamp of this. Now, Paul has planted a church in Thessalonica. Paul did it. And he's writing a letter back to him. And he says, in this letter to the Thessalonians, you don't have to tell me what you're doing. You don't have to do that. I've heard about what you're doing. You don't have to tell me. For the gospel has sounded out from you throughout all of Macedonia and Achaia. That church in Thessalonica had sounded the word out to the whole surrounding regions and area. The second form of evangelism is this. Once the church is planted, it becomes the evangelistic center of that geographical area, right? That's what it's supposed to do. This is the second aspect of it. Bring them in. Get them saved. Come on. There's one group of ev evangelists that caught hold of this pretty hard. They're called the Southern Baptists. And I live down here in the South, and I'll tell you right now, that's what it's called. The Southern Baptists, they can get a convert. As soon as they get a convert, that convert is, is told to and realizes that they're to go make other converts. And if you read a bunch of stories, a lot of stories, there's uh, there's different large denominational branches of Southern Baptist. And the pastor would get up, and you'd read this, the pastor would get up and, and uh, to, to make this point, he would get up and give his sermon, his minister, one in particular, Dr. Lee Robertson of Chattanooga in Southern Baptist, but he would, he, his church was rapid. It was just in the 50s and 60s, just good. He got it. And so people would watch, and we went to him and studied some uh, non denominational people, wanted to know how this is happening. And like I said, he preached a sermon, and it's not mediocre. Now people would, you know, half the people didn't even remember what it was. But he'd have an altar call. And you would have called it that. And he'd call people forward and he said, is it, is it my, my great sermon that got you to come and give your heart to Christ? No. Nobody raised their hands. And he said, did a congregation here, a member of the congregation, lead you to Christ this week and ask you to come to make a public profession of it? Yes. So it came through the congregation. They were going out and doing what they were supposed to do, and the Southern Baptists got this down flat. They just, just got it. They know exactly what to do. And uh, it's something to think about. They're doing what they're supposed to do. So one of the members led, led them to Jesus, and that's what they're supposed to do. They recognized that principle, the Southern Baptists did. And I'm not a Southern Baptist, but I see it. But I'm simply saying this. Have you ever noticed that how these various groups have stolen the thunder of the Bible? The groups. And I'm not saying that they're not saved, but there's different... If you, if you adopt hobbies and the Lord shows you to talk to people, don't be afraid to go talk to people. Talk to different people. Uh, Christian scientists, uh, Pentecostals. And I found a lot of people, it was just fine. I didn't, I didn't carry a prejudice with me. Good people. A lot of people got 
Uh, a lot of people became Pentecost because they got saved and they wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the Baptists told them they couldn't, that that's not what to do. Episcopalians said they're not. The Catholics said, no, you're not at all. That's of the devil half the time until, until so many of them invaded the churches. And there were, a lot of it was to be made. I, a lot of, I, I knew a lot of sci, Christian scientists that knew that uh, they became Christian scientists because they got healed. They went into healing rooms. And they went to Christians and Christians said it passed away. And so the Christian scientists would get them healed and uh, be brought in. Ah, don't ask me how and all that all this other stuff, but it happened. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses, tremendous. And uh, I've noticed that a lot of people would pray. To, I went to large churches at times, and they'd pray for people to come come into church. Oh, God sent us to church. And I used to tell them, you could pray till your tongue falls out for God to send people to the church. God didn't say that. Go to the highways and byways and get the people. I don't want to go out there, they would say. Send sinners in Sunday night. <laughs> You're asking God to break his own word about how to evangelize or what's supposed to do. You go get them. You go get them saved, then you bring them in. And then you say to him, I don't want to do that. So you pay your tithes, pay whatever you can do, but you won't do what he says to do. That's true, isn't it? Now, the second form of evangelism is the major form of evangelism. That's the second form. That's what you're supposed to do. Already, the church has been set up by the apostle, prophet, and evangelists already. They've gone on now. They went on to plant another church someplace. So they're not there anymore. Already been established. It took a couple of years for well, one, six months, seven months, a year. How many understand this? Do you understand this and see the sense of it and how it works? It was so torn up across this world. <laughs> it was horrible. Now, let me say something about minister. I feel impressed to say this, so I'm going to. It, it's not fun and games. This is rough stuff. Hard things. If God calls you to the ministry, he's called you to labor. It's going to hurt to do the right thing. Lift up your eyes and look into the harvest. It's white. It's ready to be weeped in. Pull it in. Whatever you got to do, whatever your work is. Send forth laborers, he said. Not the and pretty boys and wonderful, lazy, pot-bellied people who hang around, preach a couple sermons, and then leave, whatever they do. Number one, you have to labor at it. You have to labor in the Word and doctrine. you got to understand the Word because that's the Word you're going to feed people and teach people. And it's better to have the Spirit on it and tears over it. Now, as I studied each individual one's here, I studied years, years. And I didn't know what an apostle was, really. I didn't meet one. I finally met some later on. Boy, they were sick. But I had wrong ideas about apostles somewhat. I guess they're like cardinals, right, or bishops. I, I, I didn't know. And the more I read about the apostles, uh, and I was an apostle called to be that, and I didn't like it, and I didn't want to be one because it was rough. Some of the major qualifications of an apostle, and the major things and qualifications of an apostle was this. The major qualifications of an apostle is mostly endurance. They just endure, followed by suffering. <laughs> right there. Followed by misunderstanding continuously. Prophets too. You couldn't put your finger on them. They couldn't be handled, really. Now, if we're going to talk about restoration, which I'm talking about, I will adopt a, I'll adopt the pros of a prophet, and I'll prophesy. Here we go. That if the things that we have in our hearts, and by the Holy Spirit, to anticipate the, the restoration of the government of God on the earth, which I have been for years, it's not going to become until we restore the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and this time a government as over against the ecclesiastical offices that we look at now that tears everything apart. My kingdom, my kingdom, my kingdom. Who are you? Who are you? And you say, but, but God's blessing us. Yeah, I've seen some big churches being blessed ecclesiastically. And God, I've noticed he blesses whatever he can find. Whatever will listen to him, he does. I don't know why it does, but he does. You think about this. He he blessed Balaam's ass, didn't he? <laughs> Dr. Balaam would be killed. That angel out there in front of things. Now hear me. Hear me well on this. Just because God's blessing you, it doesn't prove much of anything. 
It doesn't. Until, until he comes to that point. Your accuracy is not, not a, a point of his, his blessing. Your accuracy is determined by the obedience that you have to that word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by spiritual gifts, right? <laughs> no. Spiritual gifts are, are no substitute for the word of God. They are confirmation of the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. It will enrich your prophecies if you have the word dwelling in you. It will enrich your preaching, your teaching, if you have the word dwelling in you. You won't have to resort to multiplied hallelujahs because you have nothing else to say. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Every ten seconds. The old Pentecostals, you should better say, fill up with that word, fill up with the Spirit. And the Lord said, you open your mouth and fill it. If you haven't put anything in there to fill it with, you, you stand there with your mouth open for 10,000 years and nothing comes out. You have to fill up with the word. Fill up with that word. Well, uh, when you're persecuted in one text, you, you go to another text, right? <laughs> That's what you do. The planting of the church apostolic church now what I'd really like to do is dialogue this because it's really unfair to listen to this teaching and tape and not dialogue a while and sit here and kick back and tear things apart a little bit but I want to talk about this and put these down because we talked about this in Acts 19 because we talked about it in the last tape Acts 19 hold on first seven verses Acts 19 Acts 19. Let me turn there real quick. First seven verses of Acts 19. There we go. Uh, there we go. Acts 19. Verse 1. Are you there yet? I'm slow. At, I mean, so you, you builders here listening to me, listen to me. What's the most important of a building? I'm talking to builders. Anybody listen to me? With one accord, what applies what? A foundation. <laughs> foundation. Now, here we go. And it came to pass while Apollos was in Corinth, and Paul passed through the upper country that came to Ephesus and he found some disciples he said to them did did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed did you receive it since you believed or when you believed and it doesn't matter since or when doesn't matter the whole issue is did you receive the Holy Ghost and if you didn't receive him then I hope you received him since then I'm talking to anybody out there I hope you received him and they said to him no we, we haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit no Holy Ghost. We haven't heard that. No, that's what they meant. Didn't mean it really. John's disciples talked about the Holy Spirit. They didn't talk about it. We hadn't heard that the Holy Ghost had come yet. But John's disciples talked about it. Then he said unto them, "Unto what, what were you baptized? And how were you baptized? Huh? That's interesting, isn't it? He didn't say who submitted you, raised your hand in. How'd you get saved? Where'd you go? Who did it?" He said, what meeting did you go forward in? No, he didn't say that. He said, tell me about your baptism. And they said this. It was John's baptism, a baptism of repentance. Paul said this. And this Paul said that explains things. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, on Christ Jesus, so John's baptism was a preparatory uh, interim baptism. Get people ready. No. It was a preparatory thing. Thousands and thousands of Jews. Did you know that every Jew that walked into the baptism of water in the Jordan and were baptized by John the Baptist were automatically excommunicated from Israel? They were done away with. You done, you done, done. Because the Bible said that the law and the prophets were until John 
and he preached the kingdom of heaven. John did. We say the law and the prophets were to the cross, but no, it was unto John. The law and the prophets were unto John, and all those who were baptized by John's baptism were baptized in preparation for the coming of Mashiach. Now, there's a bunch to that, which we need to talk about, but we're not going to right now. It, it started a whole big way. Verse 5 says this, And when they heard this, they were uh, raised their hands, right, and went back to the room. Is that right? Got their little card? No. They came forward, correct? If you're reading this, let's see more. They, uh, they were baptized, weren't they? Baptized in the name of Jesus? Huh. That's something, isn't it? You ever heard gimmickry of this sort? When the altar call is given and you call people to an altar that doesn't exist. I don't mean to be mean, it just is. Jesus held up both hands for you at Calvary. Can't you hold up one hand for him? Come on, now come on. Jesus walked all the way to Calvary. Can't you walk down the aisle for him? What, what does have to, I've listened to that for so many years and just throw up. What does it have to do with the gospel? Brothers and sisters, I challenge you this. To look at some of the things that, that uh, we're doing in the light of God's word. The reason that we're getting superficial conversions is because we do superficial things. They're not lasting. It's because we're preaching a superficial message. It's not taking. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were, they were, they were what? They were baptized. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And when Paul laid hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak with tongues and prophesying. Now, what did Peter say in the day of Pentecost? What did he say? What did Peter say? Repent and be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. Now along comes Paul, right? Paul's supposed to be different, but he's the... Uh, I don't want to talk about historical controversy, but there's a whole branch of Protestantism that says Paul was different than Peter and Jesus. And initiation he wasn't. It was <laughs> the same thing. Paul said this. Repentance, baptism... And be filled with the Holy Spirit. Same initiation that Peter taught. Same keys. Same thing. And uh, that's the call. Now, you, 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 the world will get around that you're reformed and you speak in tongues and so forth, so on, so on. And uh, I, I, listen. I had the same thing happen to me. This is all passed away. I had pastors and talk to me about it, preachers and teachers. Well, this all passed away with the first disciples, with the first apostles, you know, passed away. And I said, it didn't have to pass away. And I read this to them. I said, Where, what happened about this? And 11, book of Acts. We're, uh, I'll, I'll get back with you. I would study about that and get back. But they've never got back with me. It's been 40 years. Most of them are dead. And, uh, and then the tongues, when Peter opened it to Cornelius, they didn't, the tongues ended there, right? That's what they said. And uh, and I did say this, sir, what, what, what about Acts 19? You know, where Paul got hold of the fellows who were baptized in John's baptism and then went on to tell them about repentance and baptism. And uh, I read Acts 19 to people and to them. And like I said, they consider it, but they never got back to me. In the little town that I lived in, these, these men did not get back to me. They had, they were stuck in their own little worlds of what they taught or what they learned in semin, sem, seminary. What are we all inclined to do? We're inclined to bring our own system of teaching to the Bible for confirmation, what we believe, to get the Bible to confirm it. Whether you're Reformed, Arminian, Calvinisms, Nazarenes, or whatever you might be, you bring your own system to the Bible. 
The Bible is the judge of your system, not your system. It's not the judge of the Bible. No, it's not. Now, we come up with a what-if question. Okay, Baker, you're saying initiation is repentance, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yep, and that's what I do. I say that. Yes. What if I don't get baptized? I heard a lot of this. I don't answer that. God didn't call me to answer your what-if questions. <laughs> you do the minimum you possibly do, and you'll be all right. I was never taught that. You shoot for the sun, maybe hit the moon, but you, you'll do it. You don't do the minimum that you have to have to make it through. Why? You're lazy? This is eternal life here. You're going to live for a little while and die. And, you know, I don't want to offend anybody by hitting them with all of it, right? But I did for years. I didn't care. You get them saved and ease them on into to water baptism, ease them on into the subject of tongues which they things but the bible never said that paul didn't ease anything but he into anything neither did peter he blew him in <laughs> he go, pow and the same day he says here how many were added three thousand that same hour they got baptized and were filled with the spirit of god read it for yourself all through baptism wasn't delayed the same hour of the night that jailer was baptized the same day it, it was never delayed Right now, it meant things. But you got to teach them before you baptize them, right? Nope, you don't. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Jesus, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them. You did not. It's not teaching them baptize. It's baptizing them, teaching them. Baptism is your declaration of faith right there. Baptism is what you think you're doing when you come to the altar. That's baptism. Get up here and get baptized. You made your faith statement. Yeah, these things need to be brought back in life. They were all these old courses. I love the old courses. People used to look at me, you like this stuff? I love it. I love it. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Oh, yeah. Take me to the water to, to be baptized. Yeah, that was simple. It just run goosebumps down you. It's the way it was go. I loved it. Now this is this is Mike. I've tried to teach this. I've tried lived it. It's they the world won't like you. The church won't like you. <laughs> the, the false church, the man made church, they will starve you, they will wake you, they'll do anything to get rid of you, they'll call you a uh wildfire. <laughs> You name it, they'll do it. And it's hard to submit yourself to somebody that says they're an apostle and they're not. It's hard to submit yourself to a pastor and you realize he's not either. And they're running a church just like you'd run a business. And hope to God the anointing will come. They do the same thing over and over again every week because in 1970, we were playing the organ and singing the song and God poured out his spirit. It was wonderful. And for the next 50 years, that's what you do. It's a terrible thing. Or you have the pastor. He should be there. And he gives you a come to Jesus sermon every Sunday. Every one. Every one. Or he's a hellfire and damnation preacher from the Old Testament and scares the congregation every week. They don't grow. They just grow in fear, mostly. Fearful. Spirit of oppression. It's horrible. Read the Bible for yourself. This is Mike. Jesus is Lord. We'll see you.